Welcome to Between the Lines, a series brought to you by the Charleston, the Charleston Literary Festival. I'm Suzanne Pollock, the Director of Development. The November Festival is in its fourth year and plays a key role in the cultural life in Charleston, South Carolina, bringing inspirational authors, artists, and thinkers to the city. As a prelude to the November sessions, we are happy to invite you to another session of what we call Between the Lines, where we talk to creative trailblazers in their respective fields. Our guests today are Stan Smith and Mark Mathabani. Stan Smith was ranked number one tennis player in the world in 1971 and 1972, and was known for his sportsmanship and courtesy. He won the US Open in 1971, Wimbledon in 1972, was a four time US Open doubles champion, and was a member of seven winning Davis Cup teams. Stan was inducted into the International Tennis Hall of Fame in 1987 and became its president in 2011. He was a founding member of the, of the Association of Tennis Professionals and the USA men's tennis coach for the 2000 Olympic Games in Sydney, Australia. Stan's worldwide fame extends to the fashion world with the legendary Adidas Stan Smith shoe. In fact, the name of Stan's book is Some People Think I Am a Shoe. <laughs> Presently, Stan is chairman of SSE and the touring professional for Sea Pines Resort on Hilton Head Island, South Carolina, home of the Smith Stearns Tennis Academy. Stan and his wife, Margie, have four grown children and 15 grandchildren, including five that I share because one of my sons is married to one of Stan's daughters. Mark Mathabani touched the hearts of millions with his autobiography, Kaffa Boy telling the story of his childhood under apartheid in South Africa. The book was a New York Times bestseller and translated into different languages. Mark's other books include Kaffa Boy in America, Miriam's Song, Love in Black and White, African Women, Three Generations, and The Lessons of Ubuntu, which as you will hear is an African philosophy that Mark identifies in his most recent book as a philosophy of shared humanity that he says can inspire racial healing in America. Born of destitute parents whose $10 a week wage could not pay the rent for the shack or put food on the table, Mark spent the first 18 years of his life as the eldest of seven children in a one square mile ghetto, home to more than 200,000 blacks without running water, electricity, or paved roads. At five years old, he was a member of a murderous gang and endured daily and brutal police raids designed to break up black families. The forces that turned Mark's life around were Arthur Ashe, Mark's illiterate mother, who believed that education was the only way to escape from the ghetto, and Stan Smith. With the help of Stan, Mark left South Africa to attend an American university on a tennis scholarship. He has a graduate degree in journalism from Columbia, was nominated for Speaker of the Year by the National Association for Campus Activities, and was a White House Fellow. Mark has three children who all graduated from Princeton. We will have time for your questions during the last 15 minutes. So please type your questions using the Q&A button during the presentation. And now, Stan, you, it's, all, it's all yours. Thank you, Suzanne. It's great to be here today. And, uh, and it really is truly between the lines. That's our whole goal when we're playing tennis, is hit the ball between the lines. And uh, certainly Mark did that as a young player. And uh, I try to do that through my career. But uh, it's fun to have Mark and I together. Uh, he has been like our first son, really. We met in 77, so uh, we had our, our uh, Ramsey was our first son, that Margie and I had at 78. So Mark was really the one that uh, started our little family along the way. Mark, nice to see you. Oh, hi, Stan. What a pleasure. You know, it's, uh, and thanks for, you know, that shout out to, you know, 1977, because it was like uh, a year like no other, you know, and uh, the fact that destiny brought you, you know, and Margie into my life, uh, I mean, literally, you know, uh, saved, uh, saved it. And so, you know, I'm glad that we were able to begin our journey of friendship you know, uh, back then and uh, to now be here together. 
Well, I know that you're going to throw a couple of questions at me, then I'm going to throw a few at you, and uh, okay. we'll, we'll, we'll get on with it. <laughs> okay, well, the first one, uh, it's sort of a Jeopardy-like question, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, the reason it's because, you know, I just imagined myself being on that show, which is, you know, very popular. And someone saying, you know, okay, there is uh, the two tennis players in the Smith family, uh, you know, tell us who it is. So the first one, you know, uh, was the first to uh, integrate Princeton, uh, you know, uh, as co-ed. Uh, and also the first to win a white pea sweater. Uh, and to be featured on the cover of uh, Princeton Alumni Weekly. And then also the first to captain the undefeated team of, you know, of that school uh, and never losing a set. And then I said, gee, you know, the host must have made a mistake because, you know, <laughs> Stan went to USC. <laughs> and, well, and then of course, uh, <laughs> that was that was Margie Gangler Smith. And she was Margie Gangler at the time. I was chasing her, uh, and she was uh, she was running pretty fast uh, on the tennis court and off the tennis court. But uh, Margie was indeed the first class of women at Princeton, and. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, that's what made it very special when your three kids ended up going to Princeton, particularly Bianca the, uh, and, and, and the women's side of it, and of course being an athlete as well. But uh, yeah. yeah, Margie was, uh, she probably won more trophies than I did. I've got a couple of trophies here behind me, but uh, mm -hmm. she was uh, great as a 12 year old, 13, 14 year old, 16 year old, then on through college. And she kind of gave up her tennis career to, uh, to go on the men's tour with me. As we got uh, married. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I thought that was uh, just wonderful. But then the other, you know, element, uh, you know, to just how incredible, you know, a human being, you know, your beloved wife is, is because I don't know if you remember the day, but to me, it's as vivid as yesterday of our meeting. You were practicing with Bob Lutz, remember? You were, yeah. you know, and you were the number one doubles team, you know, uh, at the time. And uh, she was sitting in the bleachers, and I was the only black kid in in that uh, milieu. Uh, and for context, uh, you know, South Africa was uh, on fire. You know, Stephen Biko had been brutally murdered, uh, you know, in police custody a few months earlier. And I had braved a gauntlet to, to come to see you play, you know, practice, uh, because, uh, you know, militants had threatened to, to kill me, you know, for playing tennis uh, with white people. And so you can just imagine how I felt as I watched you and debated, in my head, like, you know, how do I say hello? And you know who literally changed the dynamics of that? It was Margie, because yeah. she invited me with a smile on her face to sit next to her and watch. Yeah, she, um, she's, she's fantastic. And, uh, and we've been a, a team for 47 years now uh, and okay. I do remember that day because she did say well you know this young guy would like to hit a few balls with you after Bob and I uh, got off the court so there we are uh, that day after practice and you were ready to go so we hit a few balls afterwards then we went into the uh, into the clubhouse and uh, I didn't realize at the time that blacks weren't allowed to be in the clubhouse and so <laughs> we got a few strange looks and uh, we had a coke together and and uh, that was the start of, um, of our relationship. <clears throat> yeah and uh, uh, what was interesting because yes uh, apartheid I mean people may wonder what the term means it literally means apart hate, you know, it's almost like you always stay apart and hate each other, you know, but, uh, you know, when you told them at the door that, oh, he's my friend, I could tell from the looks that they were trying to figure out how in the world could 
you know, he be his friend. Because back in those days, you remember, they were making black Americans honorary whites, you know, which was... Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I remember that, uh, I guess that was the first time they integrated that clubhouse. Uh, <laughs> and it was, uh, uh, it was great to, you know, it didn't really matter to me, obviously, uh, from a different culture, but and I obviously knew about apartheid, but I didn't really, it, quite honest, didn't realize that that was the rule. Uh, but it, it was uh, Yeah, and nice uh, I must mention something in passing. That picture that they showed, you notice that I didn't have my front tooth? Yeah. Uh, you know the story behind it? Uh, it's Not tennis really. related. I was returning again from doing traitorous uh, behavior, which is playing tennis with whites and a gang waylaid me and they wanted to kill me. And they surrounded me, they had bricks, they had knives, they had tomahawks. And uh, they said, you know, we warned you, you didn't listen and now you will die. And uh, I said to myself, well, you know, there's probably one thing that I'm good at uh, in tennis. My strokes are not as great as stands, but I have speed. <laughs> you know, so what I did was that I just took off and one of uh, the gangsters threw a brick and it slammed me on the head. I staggered, but didn't fall. And uh, there I went. And you know, the long and the short of it is that Bianca became a hurdler. And she won the state <laughs> title. <laughs> maybe maybe it's where Bianca learned that high step. Um, uh, it's, right. it's good you, it's good you uh, demonstrated that that day. Um, right. <laughs> so can you tell me a little bit about your 1970 Goodwill tour with Arthur through African countries? Well, Arthur, you know, wanted to go to Africa and, and uh, visit. We went to six different countries, and so I was sort of the. <laughs> the Globetrotters used to go with the Washington Bullets, I think they called them the Nationals. And so I was the other guy and they would introduce Arthur as the greatest player in the world and, and his opponent, Stan Smith. And at that time, I think I was ranked number one in the country and, and uh, you know, ahead of Arthur. But, uh, but the, the important thing was I, had a, I got a feel for um, what it was like, I mean, to, uh, to be, you know, have the shoe on the other foot really of, of not necessarily being the center of attention Arthur was the guy, and he was he was uh, inspiring uh, people all over the world, and um, and certainly in Africa. So it was a, a real honor for me to go to uh, uh, to those countries with him. We went to Nigeria, uh, Ghana, uh, Tanzania, and um, in each place we did clinics, and then we did uh, demonstration. We played matches, and um, and we saw some of the young talent in those countries. Uh, so that was, that was one of the uh, most uh, interesting, I think uh, maybe uh, emotional trip for me to take, to, to be with Arthur as a good friend of his. Uh, we played Davis Cup together. We went on trips to Southeast Asia twice to, Viet to visit Vietnam, uh, mm. this trip to Africa and um, uh, but the trip to Africa was really an eye opener for me because it's the first time I'd really seen Africa at its, uh, you know, close up and personal. Yeah. Well, you know, it obviously became a precursor because, you know, it's a totally, I mean, it's an amazing continent. Despite the hardships, uh, you know, and the poverty in, in many places, I mean, there is such a soul to the continent. And was it on that trip that uh, Ash discovered Yannick Noah? No, that was a different trip. He saw him in Cameroon. We didn't go there, but we did go to, to uh, Johannesburg and, and uh, went to Soweto. I know that you were in Alexandria, but uh, we did see that township. And it was, uh, again, it was an eye opener to see, to go to a house and they showed us this nice refrigerator. Uh, of course, hmm. they opened it. Of course, there's no electricity for the electricity. There's no lights and, and uh, indoor yeah. plumbing. So, you know, and everybody was packed in as, as they still are today. If you look at Alexandria, uh, this yeah. is one of the, well, I think it's one square mile, right? Of 500,000 yeah, yep. people. Uh, so this is, uh, this made the ghettos that I've seen in the United States, uh, you know, look, uh, you know, 10 times worse. Uh, so 
I couldn't imagine, you know, going up without you saw these skyscrapers in the background. Um, and uh, most of the people that lived there were uh, unfortunately servicing a lot of those people that lived that worked and lived in those skyscrapers. Mm. Uh, yes, uh, and uh, you know, it's the richest city in Africa by far, you know, because of the gold, uh, you know, and the diamonds and all the amazing, you know, uh, uh, benefits uh, that South Africa was blessed with, uh, you know, but the one thing, and uh, I would like to, to mention this, uh, you know, very strongly to the audience that sustained me, you know, in that hell. I mean, it literally was to a black child growing up uh, because uh, every day you had uh, the likelihood of the police breaking down the door and arresting your parents for the crime of living together as a family, you know, and that's what, you know, you represented to me when you took me in, uh, is that uh, Alone in America, I became part of your family and family was very important to me. And I really am very, very thankful that you and Margie, without any reservations, made me a part of your family. Yeah. Well, as I, you know, as I look back at, at uh, when we met and then uh, had a chance to talk to my coach at USC and he wrote some letters to other coaches and and uh, he got some interest from Limestone, which coincidentally, coincidentally was in South Carolina. I didn't, you know, right, right. I didn't even realize, <laughs> didn't, didn't encourage that necessarily, but uh, the coach at Limestone, <laughs> you know, gave you a scholarship and, and, uh, and it was before cell phones, unfortunately. And so we, we were on the phone quite a bit. Uh, I'd stop sometimes when I was on the road and go to a pay phone and, and get into a conversation and, uh, it was amazing to see the cultural change that, you know, that not the change, but the shock, I guess, that you went through yeah. at Limestone, the first school, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that, you know, that didn't work out. And then, um, then you went on to your next school um, at St. Louis, which had a, kind of a soccer, uh, yes, okay. yeah. more of a very good academic school, but a very good soccer program. And you started playing some soccer there and then went on to Quincy. And uh, mm -hmm. and then finishing in New York in uh, in Dowling uh, and graduating uh, cum laude and and uh, in economics and as a very good student, but also getting involved with the uh, the yearbook and being the yearbook yeah. uh, editor. Yeah. So that was uh, I think we finally found your passion and your passion in tennis and in soccer, but you were very talented and passionate in in writing and uh, did a fantastic job there. Then. Then you had the opportunity to go to Columbia and uh, you were starting this book called Kaffir Boy, which we all know about and, and uh, about your autobiography of living and growing up in, in uh, South Africa. And, and, and you turned down the, the scholarship, the first one really to go to, to go, go to Columbia, finish your book. You know, and that was a strong position you took. And, and I thought at the time was not maybe the best decision, but uh, as it turned out, you wrote that great book and, and you had a chance to, you know, to really make an impact, uh, you know, to Americans. And, and uh, I would have to say, it would be interesting to know how many young high school students read this book as summer reading uh, and, mm -hmm. and got a little bit of a feel for what it was like to live in an apartheid, uh, you know, <clears throat> situation in South Africa. And then uh, what was... Uh, very exciting, of course, was when you and Gail got married, uh -huh. and Margie and I got a chance to be there and to celebrate that. And then, of course, when you went on and, and you had these three wonderful children, who uh, uh, were great. So uh, Nathan, of course, was a was a great. Ron Bianca, it was that Hurler we talked about, and then uh, Stanley Arthur. And uh, I know that. Uh, <laughs> so tell us a little bit about your. Uh, the influence that Arthur had on your life. And, and here's, here are the kids. And uh, mm -hmm. this is at the wedding of Bianca uh, in North Carolina. And that, yeah. uh, that fashionable guy on the left was, uh, uh, looked pretty good in that little uh, chapeau that he was wearing. Uh, this <laughs> is a, a fun wedding that, uh, that uh, outside in the, uh, in the hills of, uh, of North Carolina. 
But uh, tell us a little bit about Arthur and, and his influence with you. Uh, as uh, I know that uh, we've talked about this a lot, and, and Arthur and I talked a lot about you along yeah. the way. Well, yeah, thanks for, you know, bringing up, uh, you know, his name, because uh, there's another remarkable human being. That's why, you know, it was such an honor to name our youngest, Stanley Arthur. Uh, Arthur was literally the first free black man I'd ever seen in my life. You know, just imagine how profound an impact that is, you know, for a kid trapped, you know, under one of the most uh, horrific systems of racial oppression. Now, to Gail see, started, sorry, in the middle, and then Arthur's wife, Dini, on the, on the side, and my wife, Margie, right. on the far side. Right, you know, so when I saw him, it was not so much the fact that he was this superb tennis player. I mean, that was obvious. You know the thing, Stan, that really just knocked me cold was his ability as a black man to tell white people what he thought, what he felt, and what he believed without apology. I mean, that was so liberating for me because it said, I am finally human. Well, he did that not necessarily without, uh, you know, issues from people in the United States all over the world, really, but he did speak his mind and he was, he had a quiet strength about him. Uh, he spoke his mind and, and he was, uh, I wouldn't say necessarily hated, but he was disliked by many uh, uh, whites. And then uh, for being, in their opinion, a militant, which was, uh, you know, pretty far from what you, you describe him. And then he was, he was hated or disliked by the blacks for being an Uncle Tom, you know, being in the white world that you, as you all know, what it's like. And so he, uh, he had to uh, type rope, you know, that, that, yes. that line uh, all the mm -hmm. time. And as, as you well know, uh, that's not an easy thing to do. Yeah, and uh, you know, to his eternal credit, uh, you know, Mandela, Nelson Mandela, the first president of a free South Africa, who was a huge tennis fan, even when he was on Robben Island, uh, Alcatraz and Bastille combined, <laughs> you yeah. know, he followed uh, Arthur's uh, 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 accomplishments. And when he was released and they met, uh, he thanked him and said, you know, I appreciate your style of leadership because it's very easy to hate Stan uh, because it's easy to teach hatred. It's not innate in people. I absolutely refuse to believe that. We are taught. You know, the question becomes, how do you then learn empathy? How do you learn love? And I think meeting you, Stan, you know, was so huge in the journey toward my unlearning to hate, because the hatred was taught to me by the police. You know, they were the only white people I ever saw. You know, but when you came into my life, the way you did, when Margie came into my life with a smile, you know, and an invitation to sit next to her. You know, it sort of almost like brings me to where we are and, you know, to just wish that we had these human connections with each other, you know, because then we'd realize that we have more in common than different and that the differences are more enriching than negating each other. And I learned that firsthand from being up close to your family, you know, and I can tell that because there's a picture of Margie and the tr little Trevor and I'm holding Ramsey. And of course, Ramsey's a dad now and he's a coach at Duke, etc. But I held him and babysat him. And my <laughs> Yeah, well, that's, uh, you know, you, you spent, I don't know how many Christmases you spent. I think it was probably around 10 Christmases at home, at our home. And this is a picture when uh, when Trevor, our second son, was born. And so we, uh, I remember that day when we we uh, went to the hospital uh, mm -hmm. for for Trevor to be born, and we went into your room and said, you know, Mark, you've got to babysit uh, Ramsey because we've got to go to the hospital and there's nobody else here to take care of him. And so uh, I must be honest, I was a little bit nervous about that, but uh, he well. <laughs> I don't know if he bit your hand or anything like that, but 
but our kids really got to know you uh, through all those Christmases that you spent uh, on Hilton Head. And uh, this was, of course, one of those times, which is, uh, which is pretty fun. And of course, your, your family, your whole, not your whole family, but a big part of your family came down, uh, you know, a few times. And, uh, and it was great to see your sisters grow up in the United States. Here we go. With, uh, uh, this was actually Reggie Bray, who's one of my buddies of the glasses, that uh, we went to his house one night for Christmas. And uh, it's his family and our family and your family, part of your family your two sisters that were there. Is it just your two sisters or is it? Uh, yes, uh, it is, uh, you know, uh, Diana and Lena. Yeah. And uh, yeah, there are five sisters and my brother, George. And George, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was, uh, that was always fun for us. And, and our kids really uh, learned to appreciate, uh, you know, other people. As you said, you know, I found traveling around the world that, you know, we really are the same and, uh, and we have some different cultural backgrounds, different you know colors speak a little differently. Uh, even in the South, people speak differently than they do in Southern California, where I was born. But uh, you know that we're more alike, as you said, than than, than different. And but it's I think it's natural if you see somebody's different, you don't necessarily feel as comfortable until you get to know them. And uh, exactly. And exactly. so that's the that's a key. I know that uh, in your one of your latest books. Uh, uh, Ubuntu, uh, you, you talk about the fact you want to, you, if you get to know somebody, then you can, you know, develop the relationship. But until you know them, you, you feel a little uncomfortable about it. And, and unfortunately, I think it's sort of a natural instinct that we all have. We feel more comfortable with people that are, that, you know, we grew up with, maybe that, that look like us and that, that, that have the same activities and that sort of thing. And so uh, one of the great things about playing tennis, I was chasing these trophies around the world. Here's a Here's a trophy that uh, that you remember. This is that Wimbledon trophy yes, uh, <laughs> that uh, Arthur and I were able to win. Actually, Arthur and I were the last two guys to graduate from college. And ah. uh, I was the last guy to win a Grand Slam, um, That the last one to graduate to win a Grand Slam. But Arthur was the last guy to win Wimbledon uh, as a college graduate. This is the U.S. Open trophy, which Arthur won in 1968 as well. Uh, I won it in 71. Uh, so that, those were those were times we traveled around the world, you know, trying to beat our, each other's brains out. But we not only become teammates on the Davis Cup team, but we also started a company called Players Enterprises Inc. Mm -hmm. And uh, we tried to invest some of our money together. And uh, then his daughter Camera was born, and and uh, his daughter and my daughter Austin, who's living with us now for this. Uh, COVID time, uh, she and, and Camera became good friends. And uh, they didn't, I don't think they realized that they were that different at the time. And, and that was also a good, you know, lesson to me that, you know, if you grow up and, and get to know people, then you, you're going to accept people and, and uh, you'll be accepted as well if, if you get to, you know, be friends that way. So, um, I also do remember the time when, when uh, you came down and Oprah Winfrey came and did her little yeah, segment yeah. on Friends. And she did, a, she did a segment, I think, her best friend. And she did a segment with, I think, five women from Cincinnati who were best friends. And then uh -huh. several other segments. But uh, she came down to, uh, to film a segment with you and I. I remember just outside our, our backyard here uh, mm -hmm. talking about, you know, how we met and how uh, the relationship developed and uh so i as i as i think about that and and uh you know i think it'd be fun for people to see or to hear from you as as how did you learn to to read and write i mean i know that your mother didn't read and write you know uh, as you're going yeah. up <clears throat> yeah you know i mean the inspiration for me to not only hang on, but to, you know, time and time again, when I was down, get up and never give up, you know, was my mother. The sacrifices she made, the example she set, you know, and the unconditional love she had for her kids. You can just imagine, you know, you are trying very hard to be supportive to your husband and then you have to 
daily, you know, be ready to leave your children every day in the middle of the night around two or three, you know, and go hide under ditches on trees or wander along some faraway street because you don't want to be arrested by the apartheid police for the crime of living together as a family. I want the audience to understand that, the crime of living together as a family. And I say that simply because there are so many things we can take for granted when we are born into freedom. We can take for granted our families, we can take for granted uh, food, and you know, Stan, uh, from my story that we had to scavenge for, 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 for food. Uh, at garbage dumps and go for days without eating uh, and occasionally have to boil kettle blood and drink a soup. Uh, and so you come to a land with so much and you see waste. It does get to you, you know, but the thing that my mother always reminded me was that you may not have the food regularly, you may not have shoes, you may have just pieces of newspaper for a blanket at night, but the one thing that you should never forget is that I love you dearly. You know, and that's what kept me going. And so for you to have then brought my family, because you remember when I started to apply for their coming to the United States, it was a long process. And uh, you know, Gail and I were basically living paycheck to paycheck. And so they needed to know that there's somebody that can you know, take care of them when they come here after five years. And you unhesitatingly you know, provided the letters and everything else that was requested to expedite their coming. And I still remember when I saw them for the first time, Stan, in nine years, the first time in nine years, because after I left and began to speak out and wrote Care for Boy, my family was a target, was persecuted. I even ended up losing two brothers-in-laws who were assassinated following publication of the book. And it pained me deeply, but through all that, you know, you were there, you know, and that's why I tell young people and the men in the audience, I say, you know, we are not groups, you know, yes, we may belong to groups, but we are individuals and we owe each other the benefit of the doubt. Well, I, I, I do want to, you know, we've talked about this many times about the family mm -hmm. and, uh, and your mother was a, a rock. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, in the United States and, and all over the world, really, we're seeing the, the, uh, the disintegration of the, of the nuclear family and, and, and the father being especially yes. important to young yes. boys. And so, mm -hmm. um, yes, I know that, uh, you know, here in the United States, we have over 50%, uh, you know, uh, divorce rates, and we have, uh, you know, so many people, white and black, that have no fathers uh, or and or mothers, some in some cases. So, you know, tell us about your father, too. I know that he was, yes, he, he had you. some issues, but at the same time, thank you, you told me yeah. about the fact that, uh, that your mother was a rock, but your father if he was not there, you might have been in a, you might have ended up in a in a gang or and dead maybe yeah. the way. Yeah, thanks for you know you know bringing him up because the one thing and I told this to him when I brought him over because he came before he passed away to see the United States and my family. I said, Dad, you know there were many mistakes you made, but you know you also were a good man, and you gave me an example on so many fronts: hard work, discipline, responsibility, and really being there for your family even when you were being emasculated. You know because this was the one thing that made it possible for my mother to drag me to school bound and gagged. I mean, in fact, people say, you know, you, you, how did you go to school? I said, well, I had to be <laughs> dragged really, to man. school, <laughs> you know, and the reason why I obeyed and when she got to the school, she said, principal, he's a gang member already. And I give you permission that if he runs away, as he may do, send the big boys to this yard <laughs> 
and have them bring him back and whip him. You know, I mean, this, this was my mother telling the principal. And of course, when I look back, that was tough love. That yeah, was tough, tough love. love. And, she, and she even said, you know, the fact that your dad is in prison because dad was gone, you know, uh, for several years for the crime of, you know, living with his family. She said, you know, if your dad comes back and if you misbehave, I will tell him. And that's what fathers do, you know, in families is because they provide the young men, especially growing up with examples. Even my father's mistakes became important warnings. You know, so when I became a father, some of the things that I learned from my dad, I was then able to not only apply in my family, but to improve upon. But without that role model stand, it's almost impossible, no matter how much, you know, the mother can provide the love, the emotional intelligence and all the other things. Mothers cannot make us men. They can make us human. You know? yeah. Well, I know that uh, today in the <clears throat> United States, we're seeing that we're seeing so many fatherless boys uh, in, in underprivileged areas, which uh, to me, as you just said, it's, it's very difficult mm -hmm. to really, you know, grow up and understand how to how to be a man and how to be a father yourself. So, if you were going to give some advice to uh, to <clears throat> young un, underprivileged kids today, as there's so many out there that are that are that are that are trying to figure it out, what would the advice be to those young kids, particularly <clears throat> young boys? Uh, yeah, the, thanks for that uh, question, because I have been, you know, thanks to Kefa Boy, you know, to just about every part of this incredible, magnificent country. I have been to places where I never thought I could go. So I've been to Cabrini Green, to the Baltimores, to the, you know, I mean, the inner city, the barrios, the reservations. So I've seen firsthand this issue. And I talk to young men who are often in the audience. I say, you know what? I faced the same temptations that you did, the same peer pressure, you know, but the one thing that you should know is that love, life is about choices. And often the ones that define you are the tough ones. And there is one of the schools, it's called Pugdale. Uh, and it has students from 108 countries, you know, 168 countries. And it's one of the rest, you know, in the Maryland area. And I say poorest because before I came here, I was talking at St. Auburn's in Washington, D.C. and the National Cathedral School, and you know who goes there. But I told these kids, I said, you know, you have even more of a reason to be here, to be taking this baccalaureate program because your families depend on you. And to the young men, I said, delay gratification. It's easy to want everything now, today, but just remember, if you just allow yourself to break those mental chains, that's what Malcolm X would say, you know, says that the worst thing that you have to face as a black person is what you believe about yourself, given the nature of the society in which you're raised. And I think Bob Marley called it mental slavery. I said, you know, use education to break those. And then next, just remember that, you know, it takes responsibility to be a father. It's easy to make a baby, but it takes a real man to raise one, you know, and therefore you need to have a career. You need to have an understanding of the demands of fatherhood, you know, and once you do all that, Believe me, with all the problems that we have in America, you still live in one of the greatest countries in the world. I still to this day stand, cannot believe that I can walk into a library in America and check out a book yeah. without being, you know, stopped and asked for a permit and this and that. <laughs> and you know, the sad thing, Stan, is that when I often go into those places, they are among the emptiest. Yeah, well, you know that people people are not searching for knowledge as they should be, and and to me that the key to your life has been your education and your faith in God, and uh, and of course your your parents, and and of course you've, you've transferred that to your children as well. 
uh, your faith uh, is is yeah. kept you together uh, through some tough times. Do we want to explain a little bit about that? Uh, yes. Uh, then, we're know, gonna go, I mean, then we're going to go after that. We're going to go into some questions from some of the audience here, but uh, just okay. finish off. Yeah. Uh, the faith became this, you know, steadying force amid the storms of life was a gift, a priceless gift from my mother. You know, because when I remember, you know, my scorn of religion, because we believed and uh, with great deal of justification that when the Europeans came to Africa, they had the Bible and we had the land. Now we have their Bible and they have our land. You know, so that was my, <laughs> that, my <laughs> that was my dad's the mantra every time that, uh, you know, mom said, let's go to church. But, you know, I saw the power of faith in terms of what it did <clears throat> to change my father, to transform him. I mean, I told you that he drank heavily, he gambled, he was abusive when he was under this torture by the system, you know. But for some reason, though I hated him and urged my mother to abandon, leave this abuser, she said no. I love your father because there is a good man inside and my love will bring him out. And I thought my mother had lost it, you know, but it was her faith. And you know, the long and the short of it, Stan, is that after I came here, you know, I got a letter from my sister Flora and she said, you won't believe it. I said, what? He says, well, dad woke up one day and uh, he said i own my one suit and i want to and says but it's sunday you're not going to look for a job he says no i want to lead my family to church my dad he says i want to lead my family to i said flora you yeah yeah you are listening he says yes he wanted to take us to church and he did and after that day he stopped drinking he never lifted a finger against my mother and by the end of his life, he was the deacon in the church. I didn't know that. You know, you know, you know so that is, that's when I said, you know, God does move in mysterious way. But you know what? It's a God of love, Stan. You know, because I cannot imagine anybody, you know, claiming to, you know, worship God when they don't love their fellow men. Well, that's uh, it's had a big impact in my life as well. And, and that's uh, another good example of, of uh, this is an international, you know, it's a, it's a big world and, and, uh, and our faith is going to make a, an impact upon everyone, no matter where they live and, and, uh, and who they are. So uh, I was glad, I was glad to hear that about your dad and, and, uh, and, and you as well and, and your family. But um I guess we need to turn it over here to uh, to Suzanne. I know she's got some questions from uh, some of the folks that are listening. So, uh, Suzanne, take it away. Okay, that was just fascinating to listen to you too. Thank you so much. We have a lot of questions. Um, I'll start with Jeb Hallett. Dr. Jeb Hallett in Maine is asking, storytelling is so important in transferring our culture. Writing down our thoughts is also important. Both of you, Stan and Mark, tell us how you brought your children to stories and writing. Uh, well, very, very good question. Yeah, go ahead, Stan. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Well, I just, I'll just say quickly uh, that, you know, we, we spend a lot of time reading to our kids. In fact, Mark read to our kids when he was visiting <laughs> us. Uh, and, uh, uh -huh. and I think his love for writing and, and stories and books and, and history and, and even fictional, you know, stories that are, that have been fascinating to us along the generations. Uh, the reading to those kids really uh, was was critical. Uh, and in fact, even Trevor, our second kid, uh, wrote a, a fictional a book called <laughs> Captain Captain Trevor Smith. He was a, based in Africa. <laughs> it was pretty interesting. So, uh, go ahead, Mark. Uh, yeah, I think without a doubt, uh, you know, my skill as a writer came from the fact that my mom, 
and beloved grandmother were fabulous, inimitable storytellers. I mean, they could tell such a story that children assembled around the brazier, staring at the empty pots, would forget they were hungry. That's how good <laughs> they could tell a story, <laughs> you know. And of course, uh, Bianca and Nathan and Stanley remember how I tortured them with passages from Gibbons, with poems, with all manner of, uh, you know, books, because our house was literally finished with books, you know, but uh, I'm so glad that we surrounded them with that richness, because one of the beauties of literature is that not only can you travel to different places, experience different cultures, but most importantly, it, it teaches you this lesson. In history is our future. In history is our future. You know, if you read about the journey that we have made, you know, as human beings collectively, you'll see a roadmap to the future. But if you don't read about the past, you may most likely repeat it. Okay, uh, I've got a I've got a question um, for Stan about about Mark. What this is from Craig Shepard. What was it, Stan, about Mark that you, that you felt when you met him compelled to help him? Well, I think it was the fact that he was uh, really yearning to to make something of his life, and he uh, I didn't know he was a great writer at the time. Although he did write some letters that were we thought somebody else had written for him, uh, <laughs> because he had he had learned to, to write and to to speak and and as you can hear, he's quite articulate and uh, and very bright. Uh, and as an example to Africans, Americans, any any nationality, if you have an education, uh, you can make something of yourselves and. Uh, and certainly that was uh, what we saw in him, his uh, determination to be, to do something with his life. We had no idea he'd write a bestseller in Kaffir Boy and, and uh, be, uh, you know, a, a White House fellow under uh, President Clinton. But uh, we saw it there, we first saw him. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, by the way, I want to shout, I think it's Craig uh, Shepard. Uh, that's another friend of mine. And the reason I have to mention this is because, you know, Craig journeyed to Alexandra, you know, and he's a tall, you know, white guy. I mean, he stands out, but he went to Alexandra. And the reason why I mention this is because Alexandra is considered the most dangerous ghetto in South Africa, one of the most. You know, so if you're not careful there, you can get hurt. But also in Alexandra, if you go there as an authentic human being, you could never be more safe. And so Craig went there and he was treated like, uh, you know, a, a, a long lost son, you know. But, uh, you know, to <clears throat> piggyback on what Stan, you know, you know, said, I mean, English is not my first language. It's my sixth, you know, and I didn't learn it until I was about 11. I began with scraps of newspaper, you know, that I could, that's why the story of Frederick Douglass is so inspiring to me because, you know, if you remember, he too had a similar journey to uh, learning, you know, the language. But, you know, by the age of 22, you know, I wrote my first book in English. And the one thing that turned me around was when again, these women, my grandmother grabbed me and said, we are going to the white world I want you to meet my employees, and I thought she wanted me to meet aliens, you know, because, you know, you know, the whites were, you know, you never went where they lived. But that family that she worked for gave me my first book in English, and it was Treasure Island. That's, that's beautiful. <laughs> well, we, we, we have one tennis question. We have to get, just to jump into tennis for one second, from Walter Federowitz. It's a question for Stan. Given your illustrious Davis Cup record, is it true that your first experience with the Davis Cup was being turned down as a ball boy <laughs> for a Davis Cup because you would uh, yeah. clumsy? <laughs> well, I was a part of this uh, little uh, foundation in Hilton Head, it's in Pasadena, California, and we had about 
uh, 12 kids at the beginning. And they, they asked some of those kids to ball boy for a Davis Cup match at the Los Angeles Tennis Club, U.S. versus Mexico. And, uh, and they quietly said to me, you know, you know, maybe you can't do it this time because you're too big and clumsy. You might disrupt the players and, and uh, <laughs> lose their concentration. So I was on the sideline, you know, watching my friends uh, ball boy uh, during that match. And so it was a motivation for me to maybe – uh, get on the court and play Davis Cup instead of just uh, being a ball boy. And I was fortunate to be on 10 Davis Cup teams and we won seven times. So it, it, it did uh, inspire me. Thank you. you know, okay, Mark, here, here's a question for you from Michael McLaugh McLaughlin. How does society go about accelerating the process of racial equality? Yeah, very, you know, very good question. Well, that would take uh, about... Uh, 40, 45 minutes. Yeah, well, that's, answer. yeah we have a lot. Of answer? Maybe in a short answer in both of okay. you. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I I believe with all my heart that it's going to take a team to do it. That means every member of the American family has to be at the table, and has to be listened to, and uh, has to, <clears throat> you know, buy into what the plan is to create that uh, more perfect union. That's why it's important for us to build the friendships, the partnerships and the alliances. And my hope is that, you know, sharing our journey with Stan would help in facilitating the building of those relationships. Yeah, to me, it's, 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 it seems simple, really, you know, let's get together and, and really try to work it out and, and to understand each other better. The more you understand each other, the more you'll be uh, able to, to understand that other person's uh, perspective. And, and uh, that's, it seems so easy. Uh, but, you know, we, we're getting so polarized now that it's making it difficult for us to get into a situation like that, where we can sit down and, in, a, in a very respectful way you know, go through some of those issues. And uh, so, you know, we're, we're in a, a bit of a dilemma, you know, that people don't want to even give it a chance. It's, it, uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's like divorces in our, in our society where, you know, it, it just becomes unreconcilable uh, because they're just not the, uh, the interest to, to, to the, uh, uh, to, to really try to work it out, you know, it's, we'd rather rather not. Let's go the different ways, and let's not not try to do it. And, and uh, that that's what happens. Mm -hmm. Here, this is a question for Stan from K Constable. Did you encounter any prejudice as a result of your close affiliation with Arthur Ashe? Um, you know, I I did it, it sometimes. I remember playing at the Houston. Uh, country club and, and Arthur wasn't allowed to be in the men's locker room, the main men's locker room. So he was had, he got to go to the junior locker room, which is out by the pool. And uh, so, you know, that was, uh, that was an eye opener for us. No, you're kidding. You know, why can't he go in there? And, and, uh, and, you know, we, we were identified together playing Davis cup and we had a, <laughs> we had a, a Davis cup match in uh, Newport, California where, uh, uh, some dem demonstrators came on the court right when the TV started in our doubles match and it came in with a big carton. Uh, it was a milk carton. We didn't know it was a bomb or not. They came on the court. There's about six people. And they threw it on the court and uh, it turned out to be oil. It wasn't anything explosive, but, uh, you know, that was, um, had to do with, you know, we were playing South Africa, of course, and uh, mm -hmm. in, in California and, and uh, there was, a, you know, the demonstrators there. So, I was in a few situations, but you know, real, really, really, I didn't, I didn't suffer too much. Uh, I, I suffered for Arthur to a certain extent, but personally, I didn't suffer too much. Which, uh, mm -hmm. in some ways, I regret that I didn't do a bit more with Arthur. Uh, besides, you know, going to Africa was certainly uh, fantastic for us to be able to make an, in, an impact down there, and and. Uh, We've got some great photographs of us. You know, we they gave us these outfits in Nigeria that were kind of a gunny sack material. After we played a match, it was about 150 degrees, and we put, we put these on, and we were just pouring uh, inside and out. But uh, it was uh, it was great, and 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 I really realized that people 
it made you know, an impact to me that people are the same, no matter where they live. Yeah, and uh, I will add to that, uh, that, you know, one of the highlights of my relationship with Arthur and with you, well, you may remember was when, uh, because you guys started the ATP tour, you know, and uh, so you would have your annual meetings and uh, Arthur, you know, invited me to come to one of them and we had to give a presentation on why the ATP should no longer, uh, you know, hold tournaments in South Africa. And to your credit, you guys uh, decided not to do that. And uh, it really meant a great deal to the struggle. You know, I, I also felt that, you know, boycotting in one way was, was good. Uh, in another way, if you're boycotting, how can you have a discussion? And uh, how can you really start to try to figure things out? It, it really just it makes the divide divide even more. So uh, mm -hmm. I know, Suzanne, you spent a lot of time in Africa growing up and, and uh, you saw that firsthand of, of what it was like to be a privileged white person in a, in a house living in a, in a country where, where blacks were, uh, were not treated well in some cases. And so, you know, if you do get that experience, I think it's, it, it really does open your eyes and make you realize that we're, we're all the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have, there's two questions that um, sort of are similar. So the first one's for Stan, the next one's for Mark. From Michael McLaughlin, why are Arthur Ashe and James Blake the only two African American men listed among the top American players in tennis history? And the second question from Will Cleveland to Mark is to what extent is tennis today a means for young black South Africans to rise out of poverty? Hmm. Yeah, well, it's, you know, it was a dream of Arthur to see. Uh, you know, more young men uh, following his footsteps. And, and, you know, I'm involved with an academy here at Hilton Head. And, and as a tennis player over the years, it, it, it's, it's difficult to, you know, you have to get the resources to, to be able to play. Some people grew up in clubs, some in, in public. I grew up in a public facility, basically, where a group of parents got together and, and provided a, an opportunity for us to to uh, to play and to train but uh it's very difficult and you know francis tiafo is is, is uh certainly one of the, the players out there uh that uh, is is making an impact on the tour and uh so we do have some good young black players but it's so difficult white or black or purple or brown or whatever to make it on the tour uh you know it's just the competition internationally now is is greater than ever, uh, you know, with the Eastern European countries now becoming more and more committed to tennis and that sort of thing. So, you know, hopefully we'll see, uh, you know, more young, you know, athletes come out there and, and uh, show themselves on the tour. The, the women's tour is a little bit easier in a sense to get out there, but um, uh, it, it's not easy there either, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I basically <clears throat> talk uh, to young people who are interested in the sport uh, in this fashion. I say, you know, not all of you will be, you know, as gifted and as lucky, uh, you know, as say Vina, or Serena, uh, or Tafu. But you know, you can use tennis to build your character, to learn the values that will stand you in good stead in life you know, discipline, hard work, and, uh, you know, just belief in oneself. And then the other thing, obviously, is that for me, tennis also became the vehicle to an education. You know, this is within reach of many, you know, young kids. The difficulty, and this is something that, uh, you know, Stan addresses, particularly through, you know, the company that, uh, you, know, you know, sponsors his shoes, is to make tennis accessible to kids who are in the inner cities or the barrios or the reservations. Because if you can make it accessible to them, kids are very innovative and they can begin to familiarize themselves with the game rather than describe it as a game for sissies, you know, because that's how they uh, described it to me. It says, oh, you're playing a, a game for sissies. And some of them even said, you know, are you trying to be white? 
And I had to tell them that, you know, tennis, first of all, is played by everybody, but also, and this is really damaging, is that some of the kids even associate academic excellence with trying to be white. Yeah, we're seeing that today. I think that we're seeing, you know, some black kids are saying, I don't want to be like that. I, you know, I don't need an education and that sort of thing. And that's where I stress the whole thing. Arthur spent his life stressing to young players that, that, that they go, they can go, go to college, uh, just like Mark did with it, because of tennis. And uh, also the other side of it is, is that when you're training to become as good a player as you possibly can be, the process is what is really critical. And the process requires... <laughs> Tremendous dedication, tremendous hard work, and understanding what you have to do to try to get there. You're not going to get there. You're not going to necessarily, you know, uh, you know, reach your goals that you that you might have. But the process of trying to do that develops that character that uh, is going to help you in life. And that's what we need. Uh, you know, people need to realize that they, if they do fail, quote unquote, fail not to reach their goals they have developed tremendously as a person because of the process that it takes to try to do that. Yeah, and uh, my mother actually said something that I always remember. She said that in life, you never fail if you've tried your best. And that's really, really that's important beautiful. for people to remember. That's, you know, a, uh, that's a beautiful <clears throat> way to end everything. But I, we, I think um, Stan <laughs> show, because both of you were talking about it before we started the shoes, those graffiti shoes, Stan. <laughs> These are, you know, the I shoes. Are, the shoes have uh, had all sorts of forms, but this is one that's kind of interesting. It was done by one of the top graffiti artists. He goes by the uh, the moniker of B, and uh, and he usually paints on walls, but uh, he painted on this shoe for me. And then another person in uh, in Holland uh, made a clog that the, the, the Dutch people like to wear, and it. <laughs> looks just like you know my the, the basic shoe that's been pretty popular so um there's been some the, the shoe has been like a canvas for a lot of uh, artists people have done fundraisers where celebrities will draw on the shoe and and then they'll auction those shoes out for some charity but uh, uh the, the white shoe is is uh, is one you can do all sorts of creations with yeah, well, and the shoe, and the shoe really is what uh, allows me to sum up our journey together this way. I say, Stan and his sneaker, I believe, teach us, especially in these trying times, that there's only one race that ultimately matters in the annals of history, the human one. That's why the Stan Smith sneaker is popular all over the world and has the power to bring people together to celebrate the best in every culture and in all of us through music, art, sports, film, dance, and fashion. This is a sign of true love, the universal language of the human heart, which we must all have the courage to speak if we are to save ourselves from ourselves and create a better future for all people. Beautiful. Well, I, I appreciate that, Mark. We, that's in the book, and uh, yes. it's probably the highlight of the book. Uh, <laughs> I'm very proud of, of what you've done with your life and uh, what you've done with your kids and, and, uh, and your relationship with Gail, your family that you brought over from Africa to be educated here in the United States, and, uh, and the influence you've had on so many young people uh, through your book and through your speeches uh, around the country. Uh, and uh, I've gained a lot from that. Well, thank you. Thank you and Margie for having extended the hand of friendship and really, you know, giving me the love, which led you to say to Oprah, if you remember, when she asked, you know, what made you help him? And you said, well, I imagined him as my son. Oh, yeah. that's so beautiful. Yeah. You two have just been amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mark and Stan. And everybody, the attendees, if you want to buy signed books of Mark's, he has so many books, and Stan's, um, some people think I'm a shoe, you can, if you email me, we will have, uh, we will take care of it because we have signed books. 
And thank you. Bye bye, everybody. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Stan. Thank okay. you. Nice Andy. talking to you. Bye, Stan. Okay. Take care. See you, Mark. Thank bye. you for everybody for attending and um, sharing and sharing your time with us. And if you enjoyed this session, please um, consider supporting the festival. You could go to our website. If you want books from Stan and Mark, just email me, please. And if you're interested in our next Between the Lines session, it's with Pulitzer Prize winner Jeffrey Stewart and Southern painter Jonathan Green on July 28th. <clears throat> so you can email me so we can, you can get on that. And if you want any more information on the Literary Festival, please email us. And thank you. Thank you again, Stan and Mark. Uh, you're welcome, Susan. Thanks, Suzanne. Bye. Take thank care. You. Appreciate okay, it. Bye, Stan. Mm -hmm. See you, Mark. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Mm -hmm. bye. bye. <clears throat>